kind of going to come out that you do initial like prizes and then introduction of the plenary, yep. and after they introduce, the one will shut down. <laughs> shut down plenary. Uh, yeah. Shut down plenary. Yeah. yeah, so they'll have a slide up here that's like plenary number one, and then like whatever, and after that is when we're going to experience. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And I'll be putting it somewhere over here, so yeah. give you the thumbs up. Dave, yes, yes. Yeah, we put together one for good young Oh, I think that's nice. Yeah, yeah, It's fun just trying to get the technology to work. It's Yes, yes. Actually, Tom Porter. I can get one to join as well. Okay. <laughs> oh, is that what it was? Chinese? When are we going? <laughs> 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 okay, so I'm going to be here. Yeah, I'm going to be here. 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 I'm going to be I divided it up, so this is welcome, and then, oops. You look so nice. I like your skirt. Hi, Bella. Yes, you can sit in the front somewhere. Why is everybody coming in? Oh my god.
Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for being here um, at our 12th annual Adirondack Youth Climate Summit. Um, amazing. Um, so this is a really special summit for a couple of reasons. But to start, we haven't had an in-person summit here at the Wild Center in two years. So we're really, really excited to be back. And we're so excited that all of you are here to join us. Um, I want to, set, to welcome everybody here, and I also want to welcome those of us who are joining on the live stream. Um, just out of curiosity, I would love if you could raise your hand if this is the first ever climate event or conference you've ever been to. Whoa. Cool. So that's one of the other special things about this summit is that, of course, the pandemic has brought on so many hardships and it's been really difficult to not be able to engage in what we want to do. But it's also cool to have so many people here who are at a summit for the first time. And how about somebody who has been to a climate event before? Can you raise your hand. Cool. And how about if you've been to a youth climate summit specifically? Nice. Cool. OK. Well, we're excited to welcome all of you, regardless of where you are in your climate learning journey. Um, and I think that these next couple of days are going to be really, really wonderful. Good morning, everyone. My name is Jen Kretzer, and I'm the Director of Climate Initiatives for the Wild Center. I'm very excited to welcome you here today. Before we get started, um, I would like to acknowledge that where we stand and where the Wild Center is located are the ancestral, traditional, and contemporary lands of the Haudenosaunee people. The original people of this place have deep knowledge of the land gained over thousands of years of observation, and as a science center, we too gain knowledge about the natural world through careful observation about a particular place and natural system. At the Wild Center, we believe that the wisdom of the Haudenosaunee people, along with their gratitude for all parts of the natural world, can guide a better human and nature co coexistence. To our Haudenosaunee friends, neighbors, and partners, we appreciate and respect your willingness to share some of your knowledge so we can work together to steward these lands for future generations. For those of you, a land acknowledgement might be a new thing. Um, this is a map of uh, what we know is maybe New York State, but these are actually all of the uh, traditional homelands and current uh, and lands of the not just Haudenosaunee, but many, many peoples. And I invite you to visit this website, www.nativeland.com, to learn about where you stand, either where you live now or where your family is from, to learn about the native people of that place. I'd also like you to, to visit some of the um, spaces in our museum to learn more about the Haudenosaunee people and their um, connection to the landscape, including our Ways of Knowing exhibit and in Climate Solutions. So, thank you. OK. I wanted to start off by thanking our team um, who has helped make this possible. Um, I guess I haven't introduced myself yet, so my name is Elodie, Elodie Link. I'm the one who's been sending you all the emails, um, and I am the Jean Hutchins Youth Climate Coordinator here at the Wild Center. 
Um, the people who are on the screen here are not the only people who have made this possible, but some of our very, very essential collaborators on this incredible event. Um, a lot of the faces you see here are a part of our youth summit planning team, so our summiteers, and they have been meeting with us for two months uh, to help us ensure that this event is as wonderful and as youth-led as it possibly can be. Um, so thank you to all of them. You can tell who a summiteer is because they're all going to have matching youth climate program t-shirts that say climate leader on the back. So they are here also to help answer your questions um, and guide you through the summit. So to start us off, uh, we have a quick video just to sort of like get an idea of what a youth climate summit can look like as so many of you haven't been here before. Um, so let's watch. <laughs> Climate change is happening now. It's not, it's not our grandchildren's problem, it's our problem. And, and I think like the term, you know, like a climate summit, is just gonna become like a household thing. We really need to, all of us, just take a stand and really protect what we love and live for. Like, like start, start environmental, environmental public, public your school, school or, or go to your town and ask for a climate action plan. In addition to that, our green team has spoken at about a half dozen different climate summits around the state, sharing our experience with the projects that we've done um, and how we can create a climate action plan for others to follow as well. So the biggest thing I've probably done is a workshop teaching youth how to speak up to authority and like talk and talk about climate justice. Together we can make our leaders take action. You can't just dump it on a different generation because the time to act is now. I also want to introduce the place where we are right now, which is the Wild Center. Um, raise your hand if you've been to the Wild Center before. Many of you. Okay, what if you haven't been to the Wild Center before? Awesome, well welcome. We're so glad that you're here with us for the first time. Um, the Wild Center is sort of a mashup of a science center, a natural history museum, zoo, and aquarium. Um, and it's a really, really special place for learning about the Adirondack Park. Uh, and something really special about this year is that we have a new exhibit uh, that we are so excited for all of you to experience, and it's called our Climate Solutions Exhibit. And it's extremely applicable to what we're doing here in the next couple of days, as you can imagine. So we're really excited for you to get to explore in this new exhibit that just opened this past summer. And I also wanted to mention um, that this summit is part of a broader program that happens here at the Wild Center called our Youth Climate Program, where we work with high schoolers all around New York State, um, but then also more broadly to inspire and engage youth to act on climate change in your schools and in your communities. So welcome to being a part of the Wild Center's Youth Climate Program. Hi everyone, I'm Hannah. I am the Youth Climate Program Manager at the Wild Center. Um, I use they, them pronouns, and I'm very excited to be here with you all. Um, I, as a part of my job, uh, help manage the international network of youth climate summits that we have. And I just want you all to know that you're at one of over 150 events that have happened worldwide over the past 20 years. So this is a really exciting moment um, that we're joining into this international network of youth climate summits that have happened. Um, there have been summits in nine countries. Most recently, we had a summit in Pakistan, which you can see on the map, um, and in 22 states. So this is like a really um, exciting thing to be a part of this huge network of people, other young people who are taking action for the climate all across the globe. Um, specifically in New York State, I just wanted to 
give an overview of all the summits that have happened in, in our state. Um, so 62 summits statewide and 17 summit, at 17 summit sites. So um, just this past week, we had a summit in the Finger Lakes that I was at. We have our summit um, today which, and tomorrow, which is um, our 63rd summit um, that's happened in New York State. So just wanted to give you some context. So this is not the first event that's happened, um, and we continue to build this network of international summits. I get the uh, great privilege of thanking all of our sponsors. So in order to make this event happen, we have lots and lots of people that help contribute funds to make sure that this event is um, free for everybody to come and that we can support the, the, our amazing summit network inspired um, right here from the Wild Center and to support all of you in the work that you're doing in your schools and communities. So we have quite a list of folks. So, look, so let's just give them a round of applause right now. Thank you. <laughs> We also have some incredible project partners that um, not only may contribute funds, but they also can contribute, um, they also contribute their knowledge, their skills, their content. Um, so just a huge shout out to all of our uh, project partners for support, particularly um, to NOAA, uh, their Office of Education and their Climate Program Office have been an unbelievable supporter for the Wild Center since 2017. And you'll get a chance to meet Maggie somewhere. She's here from NOAA and she's get, she has some materials to hand out and it's amazing. So um, big shout out to all of our funders and project partners. Who's here? Okay, this is our list of people that are here with us today. Um, so we are so, so, so excited to be able to welcome people from all different parts of New York State, um, different, whether you're a school team or your home school or you're a community group, we're so excited to welcome each and every one of you. And we encourage you to get to know people from other groups that are here today, because that's part of what is so special about summits, is that you are networking and learning and becoming, you know, collaborators with people from areas where you might not be as familiar with. All right, masking. Thank you, everyone, for being thoughtful about wearing a mask. Um, we ask that because it's such a large event um, and masking can really help prevent the spread of COVID, um, that for the most part, when you're not eating or presenting or anything like that, that you wear a mask. If you don't have one, no worries. Uh, we have plenty that we can give to you. Thank you for your cooperation. And don't be like these dogs, as cute as they are. Um, so we're all going to be here together as a community for a couple of days. And we're going to be doing a lot of sort of intense working and learning and um, co communicating with one another. And so I just wanted to take a minute to set some community agreements for how we want to work together in this space over the next couple of days. Um, so first, be kind. Talk and listen from the heart. Um, we all care about very similar issues, but we all might have different passions, different experiences, and so it's really, really important to treat people's perspectives with kindness. Also be curious. What you put into this work is what you're going to get out. Don't be afraid to ask questions. Don't be afraid to not know and to take some time to learn, um, but curiosity is a really essential part of working and learning together in this space. Be open. You may hear new perspectives and learn about new ways of doing things. This is one of the hardest things for people to do, myself included. Um, so just really try to open yourself up over the next couple of days, and that is how you're going to learn the most. That is how you're going to grow the most, is working to stay open. Being respectful, respect each other, respect the speakers, and respect this space and the earth. I think that speaks for itself. Um, and have fun. I think it's so common for climate change to be this really doom and gloom, sad, depressing thing. And like, yes, it is one of the you know, hugest crises that our planet is facing. But in order to really sustain ourselves and to make the work as strong as it possibly could, it's really important to bring joy. And it's also really important to celebrate our successes. Because all of us here today are doing so much by opening yourself up to learning and working towards taking action where you're from. So it's really important that we celebrate that. And we are going to try to help you do that while you're here. Um, so we'll take part of that. But keep that in mind. For our adult allies, um, I just want to reiterate that this is a youth-led space. Um, and that our goal here is to really elevate what youth are contributing and 
be able to sort of inspire and engage them. Um, and you are so important, um, but we really want to sort of prioritize this idea of being youth-led. So we want to listen. We want to take all of the young people in this room and their ideas really seriously. They have so much to contribute to the work that we're doing. We want to advise and not order. Um, it's really important that we are guiding um, as opposed to telling. Move back and provide your support when needed. So while it's really helpful for you to stand back, sometimes your students are going to need you. Sometimes the young people are going to need you. So make sure that while you're giving them space, you're also there for them when they need, need your help. And help students use mistakes as learning opportunities. This is hard, but it is how we learn the best. Mistakes are OK, mistakes are important, and mistakes move us forward. OK, food. Um, I am so excited for all of the food that we are going to have here at the summit these next couple of days. Um, but we just have some details for you um, to make sure that all the food stuff goes smoothly. Um, so first, today's food schedule, we're going to have a few breaks in the morning with some snacks. Um, but lunch is from 12 to 12.50. And if you are interested in learning how to host your own Youth Climate Summit, there's going to be a summit incubator lunch um, in the main conference room. Um, so we'll make sure you know how to get there. But that will be going on during lunchtime today. And then dinner. And this isn't just food. We have lots of fun activities and music and mingling and exploring the solutions exhibit and all of these amazing things for you to do during dinner. Um, so we encourage you to stay for the whole dinner if you are able. OK, logistics. So you already, many of you, experienced this during breakfast. Um, but just a reminder that the food will always be served out on the tent over here on that little patio. And we have sort of like a circular system going on. So you can go through the line on both sides um, and then exit. So you're going to get there from the door right in the cafe. Walk around through, get your food, and you're going to come in another door that's further forward. So we've got a fun little circle action going on. Um, and we encourage you to eat um, at your table, but if you want to take your food and sit in other places, that's totally fine. Just be conscious of picking up after yourself um, and not feeding the animals. Um, also, we are doing meals in shifts. Um, so I think that you have a color at each of your tables, and your color is going to help you figure out what time you eat. Um, so. Blue groups are going to eat first. 10 minutes later, we've got green, oh no, sorry, purple groups. And then 10 minutes later, we have the green groups. No? Yes? OK, I think that's right. <laughs> um, so make sure to pay attention to the color that you have on your table, and that is when you will eat food. And never fear, for those of you who have to wait 10 or 20 minutes to eat, we will have activities for you at both meals to keep yourself busy um, while you're waiting. So more about food, this is a map of where all the food that we are eating in the next two days is coming from. It is one of our biggest priorities to ensure that our food is as sustainable and locally sourced as possible. Um, and as you can see in the state of New York here, this black squiggly line is what is now called the Adirondack Park. Um, and all of the little orange things are where all the food is from. So pretty impressive. A huge, huge, huge shout out to our cafe um, for making this possible, because this is really awesome. So give them a hand. <laughs> Amazing. OK, so food waste. I'm sure you are sort of already experiencing this if you ate breakfast here. Um, but just please be conscious of putting on your plate what you're going to eat. Um, but it's OK if you can't finish everything on your plate. I'm notorious for that. Um, but please, let's try to um, get rid of that waste as responsibly as we can. We have an awesome big composter here on site. Um, and we'll make sure that you'll be able to go see it at some point. Um, but we are composting all of our food waste. So we will have someone at the composting station um, who will help walk you through the composting process. And it is important to note that we are also composting our plates. Um, our composter can get hot enough that it can compost um, certain papers and stuff like that. So there will be someone to help you rip up your plate, get out your climate anger, ripping out your plates. <laughs> Um, okay, and then also reusable. So you may have noticed that all of you had a glass mason jar at your table. Um, so if you could please keep a hold of that mason jar, because it is the only one that you will get 
throughout the entire two days, unless there's an emergency, but it's probably the only one you can get over the next two days. Um, so we have a rinse station there um, and somewhere where you can empty. So please be cognizant of not uh, losing your mason jar. One way you can do this is we have a couple of Sharpies at everybody's table, so if you can label the lid and the um, actual jar itself, that will be really useful um, and not mixing your mug up with other people's. Okay, agenda. If you have not gotten the agenda yet, feel free to scan this code. Um, we have multiple agendas, as I'm sure you have realized. Um, but this code here will lead you to the Google Sites version of the agenda, so it'll be easy to read on your phone. Um, you can go right through. Um, and yeah, there are also QR codes of your agenda on your table. And there is a couple of examples of the agenda up on the information desk as well. Okay, so this is today's agenda. Um, I just want to note that there have been a couple of changes um, since I last emailed you the agenda. Um, one is uh, Jennifer Fee's uh, workshop about uh, monitoring birds. That has switched, and so has the um, nature's rights presentation. Um, so just make sure that if you had already planned out what you were going to, that you take another look, um, just because we had to do some schedule switch arounds. Um, I also just want to talk briefly about where the, the workshops are going to be located. I know I saw that many of you have been here before, um, but I still think it's worth a refresher. Um, so there will be five workshops happening at the same time for each of the three sessions. Um, one will be happening here in the theater. One will be in the naturalist cabinet, which is sort of around the exhibit loops and back toward the back there. One will be in Planet Adirondack, which is the really dark room with the big globe in it. Um, one will be in our new solutions exhibit, which is sort of right in the center of our exhibit loop. And then one will be outside, but you'll meet in the main conference room, and there will be signs pointing you to the main conference room. You'll need to walk outside um, and then back in to get to the main conference room. Um, but the general gist of our day, um, we're going to be here in the theater for a little while. When I'm finished, we will have our first plenary. Uh, we'll have a break, we'll go to our first workshop session, then we're going to have lunch, including the Summit Incubator lunch. We're going to have our second plenary, and then we are going to have two sets of workshops again with a break in the middle, and then our third plenary in the evening before dinner. So that is the general um, gist of our day. Um, and I think it's important to mention that one of the ways that you can sort of garner the most knowledge from coming to the summit is by sort of dividing and conquering within your team. So if you came with a group of three, four, five, six people, um, think about how you can sort of spread out amongst the different workshops so that when you get back home to your school or to your group, uh, you'll have the most knowledge um, as a full community. That's just a recommendation. Okay, important details, bathrooms. Um, the bathrooms are where you, you know, where you came in, those big glass doors, they're on your right. They're a little bit hidden, um, but hopefully they've been pointed out to you, and if you're having any trouble finding them, feel free to ask one of us with a Wild Center name tag or one of the summiteers in their summiteer shirts. Uh, also, the registration desk or the info desk um, is going to be that sort of circular desk in the middle of, um, side of the Great Hall. If you have any questions about agenda or speakers or your jar broke, that is where you can go. We also have a coat closet that is back sort of behind the information desk. So if you have luggage because you traveled far today or you need to hang up your coat and it's too big for your chair, whatever it is, feel free to use that space. Ask one of us if you're having trouble finding it. And your name tag, everybody should have a name tag. This is your ticket in and out of the summit for both days. Um, so please don't lose it, don't throw it away. Um, and if you lose your name tag or, get, or it gets lost, come find one of us and we can help you make a new one because you'll need one to be able to get in and out of the Wild Center. Some more fun things. Um, I just wanted to highlight some of the cool activities and interactives that we have going on throughout the day. Um, as you may have seen, there's a couple of big sort of art exhibits around. Um, we have a big knitted art piece hanging from the ceiling. Go read the sign to see what it is. Um, we have a student art piece. We have uh, a, an art piece created by our summiteer committee. We have a green photo booth. We have a chalk mural. We have all kinds of different things, and I highly encourage you to sort of have fun and explore and um, enjoy those interactives today. Okay, social media. Um, if you don't follow us already, now would be a great time to do so. Um, feel free to take out your phones and follow us on your favorite social media platforms. 
because we will be doing an awesome live stream. Some of our summiteers are doing an Instagram live on here. And moving forward, if you want to be connected with the Wild Center, our, youth, our um, social media is a really good way to stay engaged. I'll give you one more minute. Amazing. Okay, so a couple more social media things. Follow us and um, on Instagram because our summiteers will be doing an Instagram takeover, which I think will be a fun way to sort of follow what's going on at the event. Um, and if you post and tag us with the tag hashtag Adirondack YCS 2022, it'll show up on our fun um, little slideshow, virtual slideshow of people at the summit. So feel free to do that. And then also Snapchat, you can add us. I learned how to download a snap code. So here you are, if you're interested in joining Snapchat. Um, awesome. OK, and then another way to engage um, on, with your technology um, is to participate in our new Climate Solutions exhibit. Um, this is inviting you to share something that you are doing in your home or your community to take action on climate, and it will all be uploaded onto our new website. So anybody who comes to the website will see a photo um, of you taking part in this interactive. So just make sure the instructions will be there, but have a descriptive photo, maybe a short description, um, just of how you're engaging in climate solutions to be contributed to the website. Um, just a, a note on technology, we welcome you having your phones here. We welcome you engaging on social media. Um, we just encourage you to think about how it can be used as a tool to further your climate education and your climate work rather than a distraction. But we do encourage, don't feel like you can't you know, have your phones to contribute to workshops or social media or anything like that. Rises. OK, very exciting. OK, so. Um, you will see this slide pop up throughout the, um, the day, today and tomorrow. And when this pops up, that means that five lucky people get to um, pick a prize from the welcome desk um, when you walk out of the theater. We are not going to do that right now, but I just wanted to explain how that is going to work. Um, okay, so we are going to transition into our first plenary session. So welcome to our first plenary. We have four special guests who will be joining us on a panel for this um, plenary session. And we are going to start off um, by watching a video and then we'll have a Q&A. Um, Dr. Kurt Sager, who you will see in the video, actually won't be able to participate in the panel. He's got to go teach a class. So we're going to watch his video. You'll get his perspective. He'll say hello. Um, and then the rest of the three panelists will come up and we'll have a conversation with them. So um, welcome to Perspectives on Climate Change in the Adirondacks, How to Move Forward. Um, we're going to do a couple of transition things. So um, we're going to pull up the video. And while we're doing that, we're going to introduce our speakers. So if our summiteer who is on Plenary One can come up and help us do intros, that would be awesome. All right, Jenna, feel free to introduce yourself and you can read the bios. <laughs> All right, lovely. Um, hi, I'm Jenna Oblin, I'm the summiteer. And, um, all right, so there we go. Um, first, I'd like to introduce Dr. Kurt Steger. Kurt Steger is a climate scientist, author, and professor of natural sciences at Paul Smith College, whose research deals with environmental change around the world. His work is published in prominent technical journals such as Science, as well as periodicals such as National Geographic and the New York Times. He co-hosts Natural Selections, a weekly science program on North Country Public Radio, and is the author of four books on climate, ecology, and related topics. In 2013, the Carnegie Case Foundation named him Science Professor of the Year for New York State. Welcome, Kurt. Next, I'd like to inter introduce Neil Patterson. Neil Patterson Jr. was born into the White Bear Clan as a citizen of the Tuscarora Nation. He is the Associate Director of the Center for Native Peoples and the Environment at the SUNY College of Environmental Science and Forestry. Neil founded the Tuscarora Environment, Environment Program in 1997 through the assistance of the Haudenosaunee Environmental Task Force. Welcome, Neil. <laughs> Next, I'd like to welcome Bella Whistler from Northwood School. She is also a summiteer. Hey. Um, 
Bella is a senior at Northwood School and is the leader of the environmental club with Brian. She has been working with the Adirondack Youth Climate Program since her freshman year and is a part of the logistics committee. Bella is excited to attend her first in-person summit since COVID as a summiteer and co-leading the how to, how to Climate Action Plan the action plan session. She is Brian's biggest fan and wishes she can make ski edits as good as Sophia. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, Bella. And I would also like to welcome Josh Vetter, who says, um, Hi, my name is Josh Vetter, and I am currently a student at Paul Smith College studying sustainability. Over the summer, he worked as a facilities intern, helping to install the new solutions exhibit. At the end of last spring semester, he went to Italy with the Sustainable Com Communities and Tourism class, accompanied by Kelly Serralio, while she designed a declaration with the UNESCO Bi Biosphere Man and, <laughs> and Reserve World Site leaders. They also helped give a sales pitch to Italian students about the Wild Center's Youth Climate Summit and its importance. The Adirondacks, it, he says the Adirondacks is where his heart is. It's an amazing place that has so much to offer and he feels very fortunate to have such an opportunity here and would like to help others realize the same thing. Welcome Josh. Welcome Josh. Okay, so thank you so much, Jenna, for those lovely intros. We're going to watch the video, and then we will have our panelists on stage um, to answer some questions afterwards. Earth has seen a lot of changes in its long history. Back in the Mesozoic era, we had the age of dinosaurs. In the Pleistocene epoch, we had the age of ice when great ice sheets crushed entire landscapes. Today, we're in a new chapter of Earth history where we've become so numerous, our technology so powerful, and our lives so interconnected globally that we've become a force of nature on par with asteroids and ice ages. Scientists are coming up with a name for this new chapter in Earth history centered on human beings. It's called the Anthropocene Epoch, which translates to the age of humans. One of the biggest changes we're making now in the age of humans is we're changing the chemistry of the atmosphere in ways that are changing the climate of the entire planet. There's a very strong scientific consensus based on many lines of strong scientific evidence that we are the dominant force behind climate change during the last half century. There's a lot of complicated science behind that, but basically, what you really need to know about it comes down to three things. One, it's real. Two, it's us. And three, it's here. It can be hard to believe that small people like us can change an entire atmosphere when we walk outside and look up at the deep blue sky and we wonder, how can I change a limitless expanse like that? But if you step back, and look at the world as a whole and see the Earth from space as we can do now, we can see that the atmosphere is actually a thin blue layer, kind of like the skin on a grape. There isn't that much to it, really, when you look at the big picture. And so it makes it easier to grasp on the gut level that by releasing the fumes of our fossil fuels into it continuously year after year, we can change the chemistry of it. Scientists are also studying where that carbon dioxide goes. It doesn't all just stay in the atmosphere. 
a lot of it dissolves in the ocean because gases dissolve in water and oceans cover most of the planet. So just as oxygen dissolves in water and keeps fish alive, the carbon dioxide that we release dissolves into the oceans and changes their chemistry. It makes them closer to the acidic condition, which can have serious consequences for corals and other marine life that has hard parts made out of limestone. It's called ocean acidification. It's another carbon dioxide problem we face. But when we focus on climate change, we're talking about the atmosphere, of course. We can measure the amount of carbon dioxide in the air that we've released to mingle with the natural carbon dioxide of the atmosphere using tracers. They're called isotopes. They're kind of like radio tagging individual molecules as if they were wildlife. That about one in eight of the carbon dioxide molecules floating in the atmosphere and in every breath we take, about one in eight of those came from a smokestack or a tailpipe, no matter where we go in the world. But that doesn't just change climate. It changes the fabric of life on Earth. Plants use carbon dioxide for food. They draw it from the air through their leaves. They weave it into the tapestry of their bodies, their, their leaves, their sap, their fruits, their seeds. And so every plant on Earth, every blade of grass and every tree that you encounter also contains carbons from smokestacks and tailpipes, which then goes through the food chains with the food we eat, the plants we eat, the animals that eat those plants, and if we eat products from them. Basically, the food we eat contains this carbon too, which of course means that the very bodies that we live with contain fossil fuel carbon. One in eight of the carbon atoms in your body came from a smokestack or a tailpipe. To put this in other words, we're not only a source of air pollution, we are air pollution. Now this can be a, a disturbing realization, of course, right? But there's an amazing insight that comes with that. It basically means that science is showing us things that people have known in other cultures through the ages that we're not separate from nature, we're part of nature. Not just in an abstract form, but from the actual elements from which our bodies are made. We're closely tied to and deeply embedded in the natural world, and that's why we're having the effects on it that we are. So to continue, we know it's real, we know it's us. Well, there are ways we know it's us. One of them is that we study the natural cycles of climate around the world by looking at layers of sediment under lakes and oceans, by looking at the growth rings in trees, by looking at the snow layers in ice cores. And when we do that, we can see that yes, climate has always changed naturally and there are natural cycles, but not a single natural cycle accounts for what's been happening in the last half century. It's something unique that isn't being repeated it's something new in the world that coincides with the releasing of fossil fuel emissions. Another way to look at this is by simple bookkeeping. We can just ask ourselves what in the universe is strong enough to change the climate of an entire planet? Well, here there are only really three things, the sun, volcanoes, and fossil fuel emissions. And we've been studying those things very carefully over the last half century as well. And so we can account for what's been going on with those three and see if it matches up with the warming that we're seeing. Well, the sun has not been doing anything particularly unusual in the last half century. So we can scratch that off the list. The volcanoes of the world do release carbon dioxide themselves, and that can be a heat trapping gas but the volcanoes haven't been doing anything unusual either in the last half century that would account for the warming that we see. The only source left standing is the burning of fossil fuels. And we've been measuring that carefully enough that we can see that it matches up with the rise of carbon dioxide in the air and the warming of the planet. So there are multiple lines of evidence that show us that it's us. It's from the burning of fossil fuels in the vehicles we drive, 
in the coal-fired power plants that make the electricity, let's say. Basically, so many aspects of our civilization that depend on this non-renewable energy source that's also polluting the planet and changing the atmosphere. To put this in another perspective, to show what a powerful force of nature we've become, if you look at how much carbon dioxide we release over the course of a year around the whole world, it's a hundred times more than all the world's volcanoes combined. So in the age of humans, we're realizing that we're not only part of nature, we're a force of nature. So let's continue. We know it's real. We know it's us. We also know that it's here. It's not just something happening far away to other places and other people. Right here in the Adirondacks, we can see the signs of this change too. When we look at the weather records from the area, we see clear evidence of the warming over the last century and especially the last half century, just as the planet is doing. Basically, we can feel it on the ground as a change of the seasons. We're getting shorter, milder winters and longer, hotter summers. We can see signs of this happening around us, even if we don't follow thermometers and data charts and such. People, for example, watch when the ice goes out in the spring from the lakes or when the lakes freeze up in the fall. And we see the shortening of winter in the change of the ice on our lakes. One of our longest records of that comes from Lake Champlain. It goes back more than two centuries. And we can see with that that during the entire 1800s, there were only three winters when the main basin of Lake Champlain didn't freeze completely in winter. Now it's become more and more common during the last half century especially that it's now normal for Lake Champlain's main basin not to freeze over completely in winter. At Paul Smith's College where I teach, we've been monitoring when the robins come back in spring when the spotted salamanders migrate at night to their breeding pools in the woods, when the bees come out of the ground, when the red maples open up. We've been doing that since 1990, and we see that most of those are doing what they do earlier in the spring as the world warms. We also watch what's happening in the fall when the greatest warming is actually happening. At the college, we have students who go out on a regular basis and measure the temperature of the lake as well as the plankton in the lake. And again, we see that the warming of the atmosphere is reflected in the warming of the surfaces of the lake, which has profound effects on the ecology of the lake. We also see as the world warms and there's more evaporation from the oceans and more moisture goes into the air and the air becomes more energetic with that heat energy, that rainstorms are becoming stronger on average as well. So when we get our big heavy rainstorms now, the heaviest of those are heavier than they used to be in the past. And that's a pattern that we see around the world too. In addition to the warming, it's been getting wetter on average here in the Adirondacks. We see that in the lakes as well, even without rain gauges. Lakes are like natural rain gauges. And you can see that the level of the lakes has risen over time if you look carefully at a lake that you know. You can look around the edges of the lake and see that the roots of trees grow down into the water. And of course, trees don't sprout underwater. So that can tell you that the water has come up since the trees took root. In Bear Pond near Paul Smith's College, we have a small island that used to be in the middle of the lake and is now submerged. There was even a tree growing out of the top of it, which has now been drowned. And there's even a no camping sign still attached to the old tree trunk for the island, which is now underwater. Again, showing that the lake levels have come up. So to sum this up here in the Adirondacks, what we're basically seeing is a shrinking of winter and milder conditions. We're seeing a lengthening of summer and warmer conditions. One way to look at it is the climate of the Adirondacks is becoming more like the climate of the Blue Ridge. And we can ask ourselves, well, um, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Well, 
for those of us who live here and love the Adirondacks, we think, well, yes, the Blue Ridge is a beautiful place. The mountains aren't going anywhere. There's plenty of nice forests down there, but it's not the Adirondacks. It's winter that really makes the Adirondacks so unique compared to these other places. The cultures of the people who live here also are closely tied to winter. And we see, for example, the rich heritage of the winter sports industry here. We've had winter Olympic games. We've got the winter carnival in Saranac Lake. We've got the snowmobile Mecca in Old Forge. In one way, we could say that where we live defines who we are, and winter defines the North Country here in the Adirondacks. So we're changing the cultures as well as the ecology and the climate. So when we face these realities, and it's important to do so, it can be tempting to curl up in a ball and say, I, this is too much for me to handle. I want it all to go away and I'm gonna ignore it or everything is lost. That's actually not the best response we can have. In the age of humans, we have become a force of nature. The things that we're seeing going on now were done inadvertently. As we become aware of our role as a new force of nature on Earth, we see that we have the power now combined with the knowledge based on good science to do better and make the world a better place to live in as well. It helps to look at success stories that show us that we can do it. There's large scale action we can take and small scale personal action. On the large scale, we can look for success stories like, for example, acid rain. Whatever happened to acid rain? Well, we don't hear about it so much anymore because years ago, when it was acidifying the lakes in the Adirondacks and damaging the forests in the Adirondacks, we had good science investigate it and we had strong, powerful legislation to change it and cut back on the pollution coming from the burning of fossil fuels. And as a result, the air has cleared and many of the lakes and forests are now recovering, so we don't even hear about acid rain anymore. But it's important to remember that it's a success story and it shows that we can work together on a large scale to solve problems like this. But of course, on the personal scale, it's also important. We can ask ourselves, well, what can I do as a single individual? Well, we could say, um, maybe changing a single light bulb or something like that won't necessarily change the world right away. But it changes us when we do that kind of a thing. It helps remind us of the big issues that are going on now, that it's the age of humans. It can help us feel like we're part of a solution rather than just part of the problem. But there's another reason as well. In the age of humans, when we become a force of nature, we also have a sphere of influence. People hear what we say, they see what we do. And so the effects of our own personal choices and lifestyles can have effects much larger than ourselves. And that's the key to success for these kinds of ways of finding better lifestyles in the age of humans. I'd like to congratulate you on being a force of nature. Here in the age of humans, it's an amazing, important chapter of Earth history in which to be alive. We need to switch as quickly as possible from fossil fuels to more sustainable, cleaner sources of energy that we can run our civilization on so that we can have a longer, better future and live in the world in a much healthier, positive way that can echo on down through the generations. It's also important to realize that a lot of young people today see this as the great challenge of their generation. And one of the great sources of inspiration for me is the Youth Climate Summit programs, which began here in the Wild Center and are spreading around the world. I encourage you to learn as much as possible about those 
and support young people in their efforts to make the world a better place. It's also important to learn about these things, to stand up for the good science and understand our connections to the natural world. And that's one of the main goals of places like the Wild Center. So in closing, I'd like to say, we're a force of nature. We can do this. Welcome to the age of humans. Testing, testing. Can you hear that? Testing. I don't know if this one's working. Okay. I think. Hello. No. No. You might need to wait for Hello? Hello. Which one? Sweet. I think one will work. Great. Uh, thank you all for being here. I'm Kurt Steger, and I'm just so psyched to see you here. I do have to go and teach a class, so I'll get off the stage and, and leave the panelist here. But um, welcome to the age of humans, and uh, I'm so glad to see you here as a force of nature. Thank you, Kurt. Uh, great job on the film. My name is Neil Patterson, Jr. Um, welcome to the Wild Center. I've been here for different functions and events, and uh, yeah, I agree. It's great to see the, the young people in the room today. Hi, my name is Josh Fetter. Um, this is my first Youth Climate Summit, so thank you so much for having me here. I'm very excited to see all of you here as well. Hi, I'm Bella. I'm a summiteer from Northwood School, and I'm excited to be at my first in-person Youth Climate Summit. Awesome. So um, we're going to actually, before we jump into the questions, we want to provide a space for Neil to share a little bit um, of an alternative perspective to the, the climate science that we just saw in the video. So um, Neil, we want to open the floor for you to share um, a little bit more about your perspective from an indigenous lens um, on climate change. What does this look like for you and your community? What are some of the issues that you're talking about and how are you all processing? Sure, thanks, Hannah. Uh, I just want to begin by introducing myself and, and, and my language. I think it's really important. Um, when I was your age, I was learning my own language, um, which is Skarura Kyaha or, or Tuscarora. So, Chwant Askinaha Kyatha Dekwati Ad Visna Wachthene Skarura Ekwahewa Gayadakra Agisa Sete Direchhax Waganaharate Hatwe Ekwahewa Disna. Bajaneti, Garaka, Yakutawaneti. So, greetings, welcome. I, um, in my language, one of the things that we begin 
our conversation with is checking in on your peace and are you peaceful? Um, in the old Haudenosaunee way, um, we would have uh, gathered together in this space and talked about your journey here. Uh, the journey you've all made um, to leave your, your family uh, and your friends behind in your community right now. Um, I'm sure some of you are thinking about them right now. And so we want to recognize that. Uh, we want to recognize that you're away from your home community and your lands where you grew up on. Um, and this was an old Haudenosaunee tradition called the, the edge of the wood ceremony, in fact. Um, and it allowed our people to, to remember, I think was the purpose of this kind of ceremony is when we entered a space, we could recall the hardships that you all took to get here. Uh, long rides on the throughway or um, getting up wicked early in the morning to, to catch the bus. Um, Maybe your phone wasn't charged before you left, and all of those hardships that uh, that you all experienced on the way here. Um, it also allowed us to clear a space for uh, something that um, what I like to share a little bit when thinking about climate change is is something called uh, our original instructions, right? So somewhere, sometime long time ago, all of your ancestors came from some kind of relationship with the earth. They came from a place where there were earth-based traditions, uh, beliefs about your role as a human being on the earth. Um, and so in a lot of ways, uh, many indigenous people from across the world are talking about the fact that we are all indigenous to some way. It just so happens that my ancestors are indigenous to, to where we stand today. Uh, Haudenosaunee people, um, Skarurat Geha, um, Tuscarora people. So I grew up on a small Indian reservation in western New York, um, near, near Buffalo, so go Bills, um, <laughs> good year for us. And, uh, and one of the things that, um, one of the original instructions that we were always reminded of all the time, before we begin to deliberate, where we get, begin to make decisions uh, is to give thanks. Um, and we call it Ganahara uh, Detra or Ganyonyok. Uh, call this Ohenta uh, Galiwatekwa. But what it means is that before we begin, we, we give thanks. It's the first thing we do. And it's a long process of giving thanks. Um, if I were to share it with you today in my language, it would take maybe close to an hour, um, we would recount how the people came to be in this space. We would actually talk about the great joy and the miracle, of the fact that all of our minds are gathered here in one place. To acknowledge the power in that. And to agree as a group that our effort is to Sort of like the community agreements that went over today, right? Is to pile our minds up together. Um, use the force of that uh, which is inside our, our minds uh, that we've been given. The Thanksgiving address, of course, goes on to acknowledge, uh, typically the speaker turns to the earth, uh, to our mother, and how she supports our feet, how she provides for everything we need. Everything we need is here. Uh, this is a central concept that we're using in our schools today. Uh, in the school that I grew up in, I stood up in the morning and I said the Pledge of Allegiance. I grew up in a, in a state-funded school on the Indian Reservation. And I always found that very curious because in some ways what my parents were telling me is we have to not pledge but to be thankful. And so today in our schools, we're using that as a daily routine. Something that's done on the morning announcements. Every day, sometimes at least once a week. We use our language. We use the language of this place, of upstate New York, and we engage in this process of thanksgiving. And I guess I just wanted to share that as uh, one of the original instructions. Now you're here, of course, to, 
to learn about all the different ways uh, in which you're being asked to address climate change. But this is not a problem you created. I think most of you recognize this. So in Haudenosaunee ways of speaking, we have actually 52 pronouns that we use when we recite this Thanksgiving address. We use the word we, right? You all have encountered this at your home when your parents say, we're going to mow the lawn today. Right? We're going to clean our rooms today. We're going to do the dishes. And, or your uncle says, how, how come the dishes aren't done? You said, we are going to do them. This doesn't include me. In a Haudenosaunee vocabulary, it's impossible to not be specific about our we's. I just wanted to, to reflect on that when we talk about the idea of the coming change and the response that we're going to have to climate crisis on our lands today, on our shared lands in upstate. And to say that when we talk about this, we also can include our ancestors in that formation of that pronoun we. Right? So it allows us again to remember what has happened to our people here in upstate New York. And the effort to erase our culture here about 200 years ago that had nothing to do with the climate. What it had to do with was an experiment called colonialism. And this, colonialis this, this colonial experiment is still happening. And in fact, I think this underlies much of the disrespect we have for the natural world and the misunderstanding we have with our place in the natural world, right? We tend to objectify it. It's called the other. And in fact, some of you probably are on the right up here thinking we're headed to the wilderness, right? We're headed place where not many people have been before. This is all part of the colonial experiment in many ways. But one of the things we like to think about in moving forward on climate change is working together, right? We have the old treaty between settlers in New York and Haudenosaunee people that talk about sharing the river of life. But we'll stay in our canoe ship, but we're here to share peace, friendship, and trust. And so these are all kind of original covenants, original responsibility human beings have. Um, but I think today the world is asking indigenous people for insight into. I think that part of the, the, the contemporary culture today is to say, well, we're in a crisis. Indigenous people might be asked about how we move forward. So, uh, in the courses we at the ESF, Aga Territory in central New York, uh, we talk about a different way of knowing. A, a way of knowing that is a little bit different than Western science about the scientific process you all are studying in biology and chemistry, physics. Talk about traditional ways of knowing and traditional knowledge. Kurt mentioned in the film, the idea that indigenous people knew stars, in fact. Uh, is part of plants. There's lots of plants here in the Adirondack. How oh, many people have names? That when you are able to see relationships that are apparent in the language, but not in any scientific. I think is still in many ways catching up to the traditional knowledge. for some way over here, but uh, 
how, how much time? Um, thank you, Neil. That was okay. wonderful. Um, yeah. We really appreciate you being here with us to um, set the tone for the day and for sharing. Um, we're going to transition. I think we have time for each person to answer one question um, on our panel. And all of these people are going to be here for the rest of the summit. So I encourage you all to find them if you have other questions for them um, and ask them about their perspective and their experience. So we're going to start off with Josh. Um, Josh, can you talk a little bit about how you see climate change as an intersectional issue? Can you hear Josh? Okay, I'm going to hand him my mic. Can you mic. Uh, hear me now? This wasn't on. Awesome. All right. Hello, everybody. Um, so I, I think that climate change is an intersectional issue. Um, and it has to do, well, let me just backtrack. So something that a professor at Paul Smith College always says to me, his name is Dr. Joe Hen Joseph Henderson, um, that we live in an area, we, we live in a world where not everybody consumes the same amount and not everyone uses the same amount. Um, we all might take them out, like take up the same amount of space, like personally, but we don't use the same amount. Um, and so it, intersectionality um, and climate change is super important to focus on um, because environmental justice, um, social justice is super important when focusing on race and gender and minority groups. And as we enter into climate change and enter into these uh, possible climate crises, um, we're going to see people being displaced and those people who may be forced to move to different areas um, need to have the same amount of representation as the other, other people. Um, and so it's really important that we focus on education for women, education for people of color, um, and understanding the dynamics between um, their place in the world and how the government or governments around the world um, you know, affect their lives. Um, yeah, thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Josh. Um, my next question is for Bella. What advice do you have for young people just starting on their climate journey? So my advice for young people just starting their climate journey is to find your local climate activist group, whether that be your school's green team or reaching out to the amazing resource that is the Adirondack Youth Climate Program, seeing if your town has a climate smart community or finding any other type of climate activist group. There's so many out there that meet virtually or in person. Um, and it's really just a means of finding these groups. Um, everyone that I've met that's a part of the climate movement has been extremely welcoming and really wants to find a place where you fit and you want to get work done. Um, <laughs> um, there's so many different ways to get involved. Um, learning from these people who are leaders or just members of these groups can really give you the tools that you need to take action yourself or become a leader if you want. Awesome. Thanks, Bella. And um, for you, Neil, in the video we heard Kurt discuss both climate science and the social aspects of climate change. So why do you think it's important to have a holistic approach to climate change education? Well, I, I want to emphasize what Josh has mentioned, you know, that there's a, a difference between equality and equity, right? Um, I hope you all are learning about the difference in those terms. Um, and to be holistic includes to be thinking about socioeconomic status, uh, legal representation, um, and something in the climate movement that is really important, which is a just transition. How many have heard of just transition before? Okay, interesting. So just transition is the idea that not all people have access to a photovoltaic array, right? Not all people have access to a local composting facility or to be able to buy a Prius. Um, and so we have to think about, especially in New York, with this recent climate legislation, moving forward with justice in mind, thinking about underrepresented uh, minoritized communities who don't often have access to the solutions uh, that we're thinking about for climate change. And so it becomes a much more a holistic uh, movement in many ways to, to recognize 
that uh, equity is a little bit different than, than equality. Awesome, thank you so much, Neil. All right, that is all we have time for at this moment, unfortunately. Um, but like I said, if you have other questions for our panelists, please find them at a meal or during a break time and um, have conversations um, with these folks, with anybody um, who's here at the summit. We really wanna encourage um, our communication together, learning from one another, and really taking advantage of this opportunity that we're all in the same room together. So. Let's give a big round of applause to our panelists. Thank you. All right, so um, we are going to learn a little bit about our workshops um, that are coming up here, and um, then we're gonna transition into a break. So give us a couple minutes to shuffle around, and uh, we will transition into that. Okay, so um, we encourage you to look at the agenda that you have either through Q QR code, there's printed copies if you need one, but we're really trying to limit the amount of paper. So please, um, if you have a smartphone and you can scan the agenda, please do that. Um, during this break, please get together with your group that you came with and decide what workshops each of you are gonna go to. We really wanna encourage everyone to go to different workshops. Um, in your group so you can come back together and share what you learned. So please um, take some time to go through the agenda with each other um, while you're eating a snack. Um, and just right before we, we transition into the break, we want to announce our first prize winners. So please pay attention um, and remember, go to the check-in desk to grab your prize. So Aubrey Sparks, um, Juna Vian Wright, uh, or... Sorry. Uh, <laughs> is it Vian Clemens? Right, Clemens? Juna Vian Wright Clemens. Sophia Sherman, David Link, David Link, and Jack LaQuay. So please go grab your prizes as we go out. All right, thanks everybody. You're welcome to exit the theater and go grab a snack. <laughs> 